like I'm young, like I, I got really into streetwear at that time and I just figured, you know what, like I'm gonna I'm gonna try to work in this world rather than go back to this job that I didn't really like. <laughs> My name is David Lee and I am co-owner of Mania Market here in Scottsdale, Arizona. So what did you kind of do before this and how did this sort of Mania Market kind of come into the story it is today? So it's actually been, I've owned stores for the last 15 years wow. and so my last job prior I want to say was like 19 years ago and really? I worked in a hospital prior to uh starting my own store so got you yeah and so what was that first store you started from the hospital so from the hospital i started a store called the cool in tacoma washington and the i started cool. that about 15 years ago yeah and what'd you sell there so you know 15 years ago to me was like the first kind of iteration of streetwear i guess you could say like exclusive like a lot of hundreds streetwear. yeah so Back then, brands like the Hundreds and Crooks and Castles and yeah, Diamond, Diamond and Mishka, those were all the hard brands to get. Mm. So um, those are brands that I carried in my store, and it took a lot of work to get those brands. Um, I grew up in a small, well, not really a small, but a suburb in Washington, uh, Olympia. It's the state yeah. capital, yeah. but you know, it's not really a big city. It's pretty low-key and chill. And um, I grew up there, and then one of my friends, when we were young, I think he was probably like 19 or 20, he moved down to LA, so when I would go visit him, we would like go to Fairfax a lot. Yeah. So, um, Back in know, the day, the golden era of Fairfax, yeah, too. no, exactly, yeah, like the first hundreds flagship, mm -hmm. you know, I think even back then, like, Supreme might have not even been on the block yet when we were going there, but it may have been. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, like... Uh, I worked in a hospital. Uh, I just had like a couple random jobs throughout the hospital to kind of get full time, you know, and mm -hmm. did various odd jobs around there, whether I was like pushing patients around from the OR back to their rooms, mopping up bloody ORs, doing wow. materials management and distribution. And uh, I, I was thinking that I was going to go to school to become an x-ray tech and then I injured my shoulder. So when I injured my shoulder, I actually had some time off. I had a couple shoulder surgeries in conjunction with that. And mm -hmm. then so after getting used to having, you know, I think it was probably like a year off that I had while I was going through those surgeries, when they gave me the opportunity to go back to work, I just was like, you know what, like I'm young, like. I, I got really into streetwear at that time, and I just figured, you know what, like I'm gonna I'm gonna try to work in this world rather than go back to this job that I didn't really like. Yeah, how was that decision made? Were you just like, was it ever a time where it's like either one or the other, and like I got to do this now or never? It kind of was, yeah, it kind of was because you know uh, going to school to become an X-ray tech and. There was a lot of cool people that I knew at the hospital, and obviously, you know, I'm around doctors and surgeons and mm -hmm. all that. And although I didn't get started young, I felt like everything that was being told to me was like, oh, you've got a good job at a young age, you know, like, you know, you can be here for 20 or 30 years and retire and be taken care of and all that. And I was like, that's cool, yeah. but that's just not what I wanted to do. I would have been in that same hospital, and that wasn't even technically in Olympia. That was in Lacey, which is a smaller suburb of Olympia. So it's just kind of like everybody around me was great, but I was just like, I'm just not that dude that's just going to have the same job for 30 years and stay in the same place yeah. and just be happy and retire there. Yeah. You know? I definitely feel that. And what was your family saying? Were they the ones saying that about, oh, you have a good retirement plan, you have a good like future ahead of you? And yeah, were they? I mean, kind of, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I was kind of like a wild kind of kid. So they, the fact that I had like secured that job, I mean, that was good to them, but mm -hmm. I kind of raised myself through my teenage years. So gotcha. that wasn't necessarily like the biggest influence of it. You know, it was just more like looking at the people that worked there and people that you could tell had been there for 20 or 30 years and and not even on like a doctor level but just on a job level yeah. you know and, and they were great but at the same time you know I could just tell that they were content and mm. I wasn't really just content with that being my life gotcha you wanted more sort mm -hmm. of sense yeah so you started the cool 
and then you moved down to LA from there. Was that? There was a, a kind of a long gap in mm-hmm. between that. Um, the cool is actually still in business. Oh, sweet. Um, I sold it about six years ago. So I wow. started it as a neighborhood shop yeah. down in downtown Tacoma, Washington, down on Pack Ave. And I spent a couple years down there just being like a small little neighborhood boutique. Mm-hmm. That area wasn't really like a popping area. There was a, a University of Washington had a satellite campus. Mm-hmm. Um, UW Tacoma so my whole thing was was you know having a store down there that's close to like a satellite college campus and other than that people aren't really in downtown Tacoma for much you know they they go down there they they go to school and they kind of leave it's not a shopping neighborhood it's not anything like that so we had a couple years there and then um the kind of the biggest mall in Washington State South Center Mall they're like they're owned by Westfield which is like a national company like over in Beverly Hills, they have Westfield Century City, and it's like a crazy-ass mall. They just put, like, $2 billion into renovating and all that. So years ago, they kind of approached me and were like, yo, we've heard of your store. We think it'd be a good concept to bring into the mall. We're remodeling and all that. So I brought it in there, and then um, I think I did business in there for another five years before I ended up selling it and moving on. Wow. Yeah. So you exited that. That's really, that's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. I mean, thank you, man. Yeah. I exited big. it just because, um, I wasn't really satisfied with the level that I was working at that point. Um, somewhere in that time frame, uh, I met a guy named Maxime Bushi through a friend and, uh, Maxime is this like really dope tattoo artist. He's like a, a Swiss dude in Paris, but wow. high level, like t- tattooed Kanye like five or six years ago and was going to do his forehead but Kim talked him out of it so he ended up doing like his <laughs> wrists or whatever but we met by a, a mutual friend of mine Kingston mm. and then um, he ended up to repay the favor of him staying in my home while he visited in Seattle he invited me to Paris Fashion Week and no this way was, yeah so he invited me out there and that just kind of like blew my mind here i was a dude that's been selling like the hundreds and yeah yeah and crooks and i thought that was like the world of fashion yeah, or pinnacle. streetwear yeah yeah you know in a little bubble and then going to paris just kind of like that's crazy you know, it just opened up my world so when i came back i wasn't necessarily satisfied with the level that i was working and so i moved on from the cool and then opened another store called Estate in the city, uh, first downtown in Capitol Hill, which I was like trying to kind of elevate a little bit more and kind of bring back some of that inspiration that I had caught in Paris. Wow. Okay. So I definitely see that. So you went to Paris. You saw these kind of higher end labels. You don't. You're not gonna see the hundreds in Paris yeah. Fashion Week. Yeah. Um. So then you saw that and you're like, wow, this is you know a whole another level. It's a, it's above this now and it's shown in such a higher light. Yeah. So you kind of took that and then went into this next door. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I took that and then uh, I moved myself like into the city, mm-hmm. uh, you know, bigger space, kind of changed the build out around. And don't think that I ever really like achieved that level because Seattle is a really interesting market where, you know, five years ago there were some really great stores there. And I feel like even though Seattle's a great city and there's a great educated customer that really like, cares about fashion in Seattle but I feel like there's a disparity between the educated customer and then the money that's in Seattle a lot of the money that's in Seattle is tech money so yeah. it's not necessarily the customer that cares about fashion per se yeah. that has the dollars to really spend at that level and then when we do have that customer you got to think Nordstrom is a Seattle company so there's a Uh, There's a Nordstrom flagship in downtown Seattle that's seven stories tall. And at the time, right across the street from Nordstrom literally was Barney's. So then you had Barney's there. There was another great store called Toto Kayo that worked at a very high level that was there for a while. So although I came back with that inspiration and it was before the high fashion and the streetwear worlds really like emerged, I couldn't really get my traction in what I wanted to do because Nordstrom beat me to the punch and Barney yeah. beat me to the punch. So I like I was still kind of evolving, but it, it kind of ended up shaping itself a bit different than what I'd like come back with what I'd seen in Paris. Yeah, because you brought that now you're, you're entering a whole nother pond now because mm-hmm. you're competing with those larger in con- like conglomerates, those huge companies. Yeah. So that's really interesting. So then how did you sort of learn how to start a store? Because you went straight from the hospital to the cool 
like how did you learn about like you know financing all your inventory or maybe just doing the build out in general yeah you know like i just i didn't know what i was doing to be honest with you i think mm. i spent a year and a half writing a business plan before so before i even got started and this mm. business plan was like a binder because that's what i knew right like yeah you know I had a binder and it was probably like a hundred pages and it was all this <laughs> stuff and it was all, you know, and yeah. so I had no idea what I was doing, but, um, you know, I just kind of utilized, you know, the internet and, mm. you know, I think at that time back then, you know, MySpace was kind of the social yeah. media and I don't even think MySpace was around that long, you know? Yeah. So I was hearing about all these other great stores and these other cities. I'd went to Hawaii to visit yeah. my boy and um, I stumbled into a store called Kicks Hawaii, which mm. uh, I think is still around. You should Kicks definitely Hawaii. check out when you're down there. But, um, you know, that was one of the first places I bought a pair of SB Dunks. You oh. Know? And, yeah, we're talking yeah. 15, 16, maybe even 17 years In the ago. purple box. Yeah, yeah. Uh, T19s, I think they were. Ooh. So and I think I still have them. They might be in my back room. But, um, yeah, uh, next to them was a great store called Lalo. So I had seen that. And then, like through hunting for, you know, if like, uh, the diamond, um, diamond running shit t-shirt dropped. And I remember scouring the internet and yeah. my space for stores that carried that or like the hundreds paisley all over T. Yeah. So all these like rare pieces that were like streetwear icons at that time, I was hunting across the country at these stores. And so I was always taking a little bit of inspiration for like designing my space from these spaces that I had seen while, you know, on my hunts. But then um, figuring out the business end of it, man, like uh, I had no money. I grew up kind of poor, kind of whatever. So um, the one thing I had for some reason was good credit when I was young, you know. And yeah. so I think I remember getting a credit card for like $5,000 when I was 23 and just maxing that out and putting $2,500 into building the store mm. and then putting 2500 into inventory. And then uh, I basically – just bullshitted my way into a lease from the University of Washington and sold myself a little bit better than uh, than than I actually had the credentials for and just kind of talked my way in. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And then so how did you how did that first buying of inventory go and how have you learned sort of from that? Like what's your new approach to sort of sourcing inventory and seeing what's hot and what's what's not? Yeah, you know, well now, you know, social media is is such a, a prevalent factor, you know, so yeah. I think that we definitely dedicate some time, whether we're, we're uh, looking at certain accounts um, to see what people are posting. But I think a lot of what I do is still really old school. So um, for me, I like when we moved here to open this, mm -hmm. we didn't really know anybody here. I, you know, I've met people through the store now, but I had only visited Arizona for the first time like two years ago during COVID. And that was because, you know, my girlfriend slash business partner, Angela, she had been familiar with Scottsdale. And when we were locked down in quarantine in LA, uh, you know, she was like, Hey, Arizona's open. And she had been to Scottsdale and she's like, we should go drive over there and check it out. And, yeah. you know, we can go, you know, just have dinner and all those things that we weren't able to do in most of the world during during quarantine. Yeah. So, um, you know, we came out here and, you know, I, I liked it out here and decided to make the move after a while. But, um, yeah, I didn't know anybody. So my strategy has always kind of been to open the doors and then I'll figure everything else out. You yeah. know, and I think a big part of that is, is. You know, I, I know the brands that I know and I have the things that I'm interested in. You know, Angela being my partner, you mm -hmm. know, she has her world that she works in. She does all the women's buying and kind of gift and decor curating. And then our third partner, Storm, um, who's based in L.A. as a stylist, he also uh, has his edit in the world that he works in and the brands that he is close with and all that. So we all kind of combine forces. But I think a huge part of it is is when you have a brick and mortar in a particular market, you know, you want to, you want to bring what you know and love to the table, but then you also want to know what the customer is looking for. You know, yeah. so customer feedback is a huge drive of, you know, how we continue to curate and where we're focusing our energy, like for the future buys. So, for sure. Yeah. And so uh, like, can we make that connection? So how did you go from LA starting that? So you go, you start the cool, Go visit Paris. You see this crazy fashion week. You start the next store. Now, how do you go from that store now to here? So, um, 
<laughs> man, this is this is quite a story. But I had yeah. some business partners in a state, and that was the first time I took on partnership. I had owned the cool by myself mm -hmm. and um, did everything myself. And I felt like rather than just leaving that to like a manager and keeping it open, which in hindsight I probably could have done and I probably should have done, yeah. but that was my baby. That was the thing that I had put so much energy into. Um, that was the thing that changed my life from like growing up poor to even then, like I didn't have like money, money, but I probably like created a middle-class life for myself, you yeah. know, and, and was able to like travel a little bit and do all that. So, um, uh, I couldn't walk away from it unless I like completely cut ties with it because gotcha. I was the person that was always in my store, even though I had a full staff, you know, but mm. I was, folding t-shirts i was doing customer service i was mopping floors i was cleaning glass yeah. like that was just my baby that's what i do so i felt like in order to properly move on i had to cut ties with it a hundred percent and then i took on some business partners and uh that situation didn't really work out so well and so when i opened a state we opened in downtown seattle and there was a space that i really loved that i used to shop at because it used to be a doc martin store so it was like a hundred year old historical building. And so we've got hundred year old hardwood floors wow. with like character that, you know, you just can't, you can't recreate yeah. that They're hundred years old yeah. brick walls and just all that vibe. So I really wanted to be in that space cause I loved it so much. And when talking with the ownership about getting a lease for it, they had mentioned that they were in the, they were trying to sell the building and it was on the market, but it had been on the market for something like 12 years. So wow. they, so uh, all the construction that's happening in Seattle is, you know, all the tech that's going on there. Yeah. Right. So usually yeah. it's buy a building, demo it, build something new. Yeah. That building was actually designated by the city as a historical landmark. So with it being on the market for 12 years, knowing that people were more interested in demoing buildings rather than paying more to retrofit them and, yeah. and rebuild them. In my mind, I was like, okay, we'll still be here for a long time. Only if only even though he's only offering me a uh, a month to month lease, mm -hmm. and then my luck, a month after we opened, the building sold. No, yeah. So the building sold, and so we had about a year to do business there while they were gathering their permits because they were turning it into a hotel. And funny story, but my store was called Estate, and mm -hmm. then the the store they ended or the hotel they ended up opening in there ended up being called The State. So they uh, kicked me out kicked and they kind of the stole my name a little bit. Wow. Yeah. That's rough. But um, so when all that happens, like the partnership wasn't going well anyways. And then um, I become close, uh, really close with a guy named John Baldwin, who's mm -hmm. based in L.A., has a show or had a showroom called Lush Network. And we were really close. And he basically invited me to come down to L.A. and um, join the showroom. And okay. Yeah, we had some projects planned and all that. And so I moved to L.A., moved in with him was working in the showroom and then um out of nowhere my former business partner who i hadn't spoken to in like six months ends up hitting me up like yo i just signed a lease you know on capitol hill you've got to essentially drop your life and come back and open the store and owner operate it because i have a contract saying that you do and if you don't so i was in la for like six months and you know uh -huh. doing things in the showroom and had some plans to grow the showroom and add some retail um, components to it and all that. And then basically my life got turned upside down and I was forced back into go reopening a state in a new location. And that became short, uh, very short lived because mm -hmm. of some things that my business partner was going through personally that I won't get into, but yeah. everything was just fucked from the jump basically. Yeah. So, That's yeah. a rough situation to be thrown into. Yeah. You know, it was and. You know, so I, I dealt with that and I did what I was supposed to do and, and whatever. And then um, those doors closed. Uh, COVID happened. All the rioting on Capitol Hill specifically yeah. happened. Um, you know, the world gets shut down for a while. And then Angela and I, you know, she, she shows me Scottsdale. Mm. We kind of really rediscover it as a place that we could see ourselves living and where my life had already kind of been creeping towards this kind of desert lifestyle. Like yeah. Over the years, I went from like, you know, the streetwear guy whose shoes were matching his hat and made sure I yeah. had all the newest clothes to, 
you know, my, the last handful of years of my life, it's like I'm this old Harley dude that fucking has traveled around the Southwest on my Harley and fucking, you know, had long ass hair and a beard that I didn't shave for months. And so, you know, wanting to come out here and open this was just first and foremost wanting to come out here and, and live the desert kind of lifestyle a little yeah, bit yeah. and kind of slow things down from the pace of L.A. and Seattle. And then a big factor in doing that was, you know, wanting to start something with Angela, but then also our third partner, Storm, who's like a little brother to me. Mm. Uh, he started shopping in the cool when he was 15 years old. In no high way. School. Yeah. And now you guys are partners. And now we're business partners. That's yeah. beautiful. You know, he uh, he worked for me at the cool mm -hmm. for um, certain years. Uh, he lived with me prior to moving to L.A., um, when I moved to L.A., he came down like a month after me, but he had his own friend group down there, so he ended up moving in with his friends. Uh, I had brought him on a trip to Paris when he had told me that he wanted to start a brand, and I wanted to show him that, you know, this world is bigger than what he knew of the store, and it's bigger than, you know, T-shirts on Fairfax and all that stuff. So I had brought him to Paris where he met, you know, some of my friends in the industry and met some friends of my friends who uh, I have some friends from Boston that are really close to a store called Bodega. Shout out to Tofu and fucking Mike and fucking guys old G made. But um, so he met the Bodega crew out in Paris. And then when they opened a Bodega L.A., he ended up getting a job there and interning at John's showroom. And then he's parlayed that into a styling job where he's been Bad Bunny stylist for like the oh, last wow. three, three and a half years. So, wow. yeah, he's on the road with them right now. And he was even in Philly just this week with them. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I know he was coming through. Yeah. yeah, Bad Bunny was. That's crazy. Yeah. So that's awesome. So I think that's kind of where what my role became mm -hmm. over the last several years was um, anybody that's helped me or anybody that's been there for me or anybody that was a part of my journey, I felt like rather than being concerned with having a store for the sole purpose of making money or having a store for the sole purpose of like always having the newest coolest shit i think that this iteration of the store is more about me like giving back and working with the people oh wow that had been there for me yeah yeah so, that's really sick yeah so then what is the new sort of you've learned all of, through all these stores you learned so like a bunch of different things um, course like you stuff like doesn't work out and then so you like learn okay i'm not gonna do this what has been like the biggest thing you brought to this store that has been sort of like a, a learning experience along the road of opening all these stores you know it's weird because you know as much experience as you know i'd like to think that i have things change so fast in this world that i feel like i'm really starting over from scratch and it almost feels like everything that I've done in the years prior has just kind of been leading up to doing this now. I feel like I've learned how to, um, you know, through a, through a business partnership that didn't work out before, I've learned how to, to filter people out better, you know. I think that, um, I think the most important thing that I've learned is really just about selflessness, you know. Yeah, sure. During COVID and quarantine, um, I had kind of lost my passion to work in this world, you know, and, and I kind of like was, was jaded by some of it, to be honest with you. And then was kind of just taking that time. Cause I'd never really taken like real, like real time off of work. I was just always working out at that point. I think I'd been doing this for like 13 years, you know? So, um, I, uh, I was exploring other things that I'm interested in, not even as like career fields, but just doing all the things that I said that I would do if I had time, right? Like strapping like a duffel bag to the sissy bar of my motorcycle and just getting out and riding and, you know, and things like that, that I'd never taken the time to do. So um, I think now, yeah, you know, the biggest thing that I learned is just having the right team around me and then combining forces in that, like I can't do it all myself as to where I used to always do everything myself. But um, just just understanding the abilities and talents that the people around you have and um, just really working with so everybody is like maximizing their potential. Wow. Yeah, for sure. And I think a lot of people struggle with that point as well. You, you do so much. You open your whole store by yourself and it's just you and you think you're the only person you can count on. Now, mm -hmm. how do you bring on employees? Like, how do you find people that, you know, you can trust and 
work with you and, and work on stuff with you. Yeah, you know, I've always had like a, a great staff around me, you mm. know, um, and I think that the way that I've always brought on staff, I don't I don't ever look at it as I'm just hiring somebody. Like I said, I told you about Storm. He started as a customer. He worked. I don't even like to say for me. He worked with me. Yeah. And then, um, you know, and now he's a business partner here. So anybody that I've ever had as staff, I'm still in contact with to this day, whether it's Tobe and he was 15 when he worked for me and you know this was like 15 years ago um you know i still talk to him on like a weekly basis yeah you know? for sure like so everybody that's ever worked for me i'm in contact with they're they're my family you know mm. they're you know um i don't think anybody has anything bad to say about me i don't have anything bad to say about them so that's kind of my approach you know is angela and i are here doing everything ourselves right now because i feel like that's important in building a business yeah but i also feel like when we kind of meet the right people, they'll reveal themselves, you know, and For people sure. that, you know, that, that we trust and that we're comfortable with because we're not just bringing them into like a job, but I feel like we're bringing them into a family. Mm. And then from there, you know, like I'll do anything I can in my power to help them get where they're going. You know, yeah. I've told that to a lot of my staff over the years where like, as much as I would love to have them around forever, they're going to hit a ceiling working for me, right? Like mm. they're never going to be the top of the food chain as long as they're working for me. And they're only going to make X amount of dollars, you know, being a, an associate in a store. Like I'll do my best to always take care of them. But the reality is, is, you know, like if you're, you know, working customer service in a store, there's going to be a ceiling, you know? Yeah. So I've always encouraged them that like to think bigger than that and, if they have any goals and dreams and, and projects of their own that I'm always going to do what I can to put them in a position to take what they want to do further, you know? And I, sure. I tell the story about storm so much because I feel like that's a person that, that actually like proves what I've been saying. Yeah. The whole time. You yeah. Know, like a lot of people can say that, but then I use him as an example of like, look what he's done now. Yeah, you know? for so, sure. And that's important to me you know, to see him succeed. And that's mm -hmm. like probably like my biggest point of pride in all of this. You know, I've had stores for 15 years, but I don't think that I really do much. And honestly, this doesn't really take that much. You know, at the end of the day, I'm a guy that just likes to come in here, hang out, meet new people, whether we talk about clothes or shoes or whatever. But mm -hmm. this is just my vehicle to like share ideas and, you know, meet people and, and kind of kick it and stay relevant to yeah. the things that I love. But um, seeing somebody like Storm is really like, OK, you know, now I've kind of backed up that like somebody has taken something further, you know, and I yeah. love to see that because that kid's done way more than I ever have, you know. Yeah. So. And you're able to like just, you know, push someone in that direction is, yeah. is amazing. That's yeah. awesome. So kind of like switching gears a little bit. We're in a mall right now. How does the mall kind of play into the, the world of opening up a brick and mortar store? Yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting because when I when I sold the cool, um, I kind of told myself that I would never open a store in a mall setting again because it did start to wear me down, you know, seven days a week. The hours are longer, you know, the customer at times it can feel a lot less personal. And so that that kind of played a factor into me moving on from that as well. And so it was something that I told myself that I would never do again because I was almost kind of like borderline, like unhappy at that point in my life, you know. So um, without knowing anybody here in, in the Phoenix, Scottsdale area or in Arizona in general and only hadn't, hadn't, uh, having visited here a couple of times, this seemed like the place to do it where um, this just felt like where people come, you know. And when you factor in the weather here and my first summer here last summer, I lived maybe like 45 minutes to an hour north of here kind of out in the middle of nowhere. I lived three miles down a dirt road um, next to a national forest surrounded by ranches and stuff because I really wanted that like solitude mm -hmm. desert lifestyle coming out of Echo Park LA and yeah. just madness, you know? So, um, but I didn't get to leave the house that much over the summer because it hit like 115 degrees and I got like a Harley and an old 73 Bronco. So I had no air conditioning. So I was like <laughs> landlocked yeah. for a while, you know? So I just figured that probably like factors into how people shop here, you mm -hmm. know? 
Um, I still don't know the city all that well, and I'm starting to just kind of spread out and figure it out and see if there's those like neighborhood, like foot traffic shopping districts. But um, it just seemed to me that like it gets so hot that people are probably still coming to the mall because it's indoors, it's air conditioning. And then, you know, I look out of my window to Dior flagship, you know, I'm literally we're sitting above St. Laurent right now. You know what I mean? So we've got Nobu out there. So I figured, okay, if those stores are here, this feels less like a, a mall to me. But it feels like, you know, that this is where people come for fashion still you know so that's kind of what justified my decision in this process you know and we're surrounded by great stores over here um the people over at 151 they've been really great to us uh the girls over at rock and streetwear uh they're like the sweetest so even though we're in a mall i feel like we have this like like streetwear kind of fairfax community you know we all say what's up to each other we'll all pop into each other's stores just see how it's going you know it's it's no tension it's all love so i feel like we have our own thing going on on this side over here that's you know? sweet yeah that's sweet now like you started in the beginning of the sort of the streetwear era mm -hmm. and then back then the internet wasn't so prevalent for shopping and now like it's, it's, it's massive like it's one of the biggest platforms but with the internet you don't have the ability to come in and try on certain items like how do you feel your store does or how does you how do you feel like opening a store versus like opening an online sort of uh e-commerce yeah store? you know we're we're working towards e-commerce and uh, that's something that we want to launch when we put out our first collection as a brand mm -hmm. but i still like you said you know you can't beat like face-to-face -face personal relationships the reason why angela and i are here so much because i feel like telling our story and really connecting with people and you know, people knowing that as owners, we don't feel like we're too good enough to be or we're too good to be here working in our stores. And then I also think that, you know, like whether it's streetwear or fashion in general, it's still like a very impulsive kind of in the moment lifestyle. Yeah. And even me, like I don't even online shop that much. And then when I do like even waiting for Amazon Prime for two days, like kind of drives me crazy because like when I want something, I want it like yeah. now, you know. So I feel like, you know, all those things like nobody's ever going to stop the internet you're never going to stop online shopping but i feel like there's still a space for ground level face-to-face -face interaction for building clientele kind of old school by like just talking to and connecting with people and then um you know just just being here so like when people just want that thing for tonight real quick you know and yeah, they might be able to get something overnight shipped or whatever. But I think that a lot of what this area, um, I think a lot of what the business in this area is, is really for going out on the weekends. And this is a tourist destination for the area as well. So I still think that, you know, uh, brick and mortar shopping really thrives here just because there's such a cross section of people, whether it's people that need something for dinner to go out to the club, whether it's tourists that just want to bring something back because I mean, yeah, you can online shop anywhere, but the whole point of traveling and visiting places is to see the area and not necessarily to spend money, but to like bring something back with you, whether tangible or intangible, you know? Yeah. To kind of so. keep that memory of the, the yeah. area. So Very cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I think this is a perfect place. I didn't even realize it until recently of like how much foot traffic this mall would get. A lot of malls in the nowadays are closing, but mm -hmm. this mall has, has been one of the most popular and mo the highest population I've seen in, in a long time. Yeah, you know, and, and that was I, I think we were really rolling the dice on this. You know, we're not from here. I didn't even have much experience here, so I can't say that I even did a whole lot of research to um know that we were necessarily making the right decision but you know if you look downstairs right now like Louboutin is under construction if yeah. you look over by the food court like Balenciaga is under construction Dior was under construction while we were under construction for the space so s something told me like even though that's the case in most markets where malls are closing and they are dying mm -hmm. it just felt like well Dior is not opening a fucking huge flagship if this mall is dying you yeah know, like for so sure. it, it, it felt like there's something special about this area. And we've been open here for a little over uh, three and a half months. And I think that like um, that we were kind of right, you know, like it is kind of popping, you know, yeah. it has its slow periods. And every day to us is like a blessing. Every month is a blessing, you know. So I feel like uh, we're still learning what the patterns are mm -hmm. here and all that. But we've been doing better than we expected. So, uh, 
yeah, there's a lot to be thankful here. That's sure. awesome. Yeah. And about the build of the store, what um what inspired this build out, and and how much do you think the build out adds to the store as for a customer to come in and and really kind of grab their attention? Yeah, I think build out is huge, man. You know, um, the inspiration for this was just kind of a culmination of all the spaces that I've had. The cool was like a thousand square feet in in South Center. And I tried to keep that kind of really minimal, but there's only so much you can do in a thousand square feet. And yeah. then when I got into bigger spaces in the city, like I took certain elements and then I brought that in. Like when I opened a state in downtown Seattle, we essentially had two spaces with a wall removed in the middle. And so I had about 50 feet of width and mm. I built like a 10 foot tall, 50 foot wide living plant wall that was like the biggest headache in the world, like watering plants, yeah. in old ass downtown Seattle and all yeah. that. So, you know, and that's where kind of this came from, yeah, you know, but beautiful. kind of bringing it with like the desert plants and all that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, being from Seattle, you know, I feel like we're used to such greenery. So green kind of became our central color here just to kind of like as a nod to home. The desert is so opposite in that it's like, you know, it's sand and it's desert. And yeah. even the way the buildings are painted around here, if you drive around, you see that like a lot of the buildings are all like, you know, kind of tan, khaki, kind of Pueblo or yeah. Casa color or whatever. So we just kind of like wanted to bring like having some greenery in here feels like it, even though they're desert plants and whatever, it still kind of feels like we're like an homage to Seattle and home, which is a very like kind of lush green place. Awesome. So, but we still wanted to kind of keep it minimal. It's a huge space, so that's not hard to keep things yeah. minimal. I think that if we had this amount of product in the selection in one of my former stores, it'd be like really packed, mm -hmm. but we're still able to keep it really kind of clean and simple. I think that we still have room to grow into the space without like cramming it full of stuff. And even prior to us, the space was an art gallery. Oh. So even though, you know, it was dark gray and black before and mm -hmm. it was carpeted and all that, I feel like we kind of took the fact that it was a gallery and I feel like, if anything, we made it more of a gallery than yeah. it actually was prior, you know? Yeah. Like, but now it's just like clothes are, are the pieces that we present. Yeah, I definitely see that. Yeah. That's really nice. Speaking of, um, like, move or growing, and um, what is your next steps with uh, the store and the move? I, you were talking about uh, you're dropping your own line. Yeah. Um, how is that going to play into uh, effect with the lifespan of the brand? And I'm um, ready to go with that. Yeah, I think overall, you know, um, I've never really had a consistent shop brand, which I do think is like very important. But um, over the years, I've kind of always been like my own worst critic. And I think that I've like always gotten in my own head so much or I want everything so perfect that that's actually like prevented me from actually releasing things. So I think I'm just in a stage of my life where I'm kind of over that. And like I said, now with my partners, you know, I think that now it's not necessarily me making the decisions on, you know, like, or me, me being able to tell myself to not put something out because it's not good enough. So now, you know, um, with the partners, you know, we make those decisions as a whole, but, um, I think that's important. I think that that's something that I really want to build here. Uh, I'm not super aware with everything that's going on here yet, but almost from customer feedback, it kind of seems like there's not really like a strong local brand that people are like really representing here. And I think that we've already seen some really loyal customers. And I think that we've seen a good enough base to where I'm kind of confident that we'd have some people that would like stand behind some of the things yeah, that we put out, you know, for sure. So with a lot of other brands or stores I've talked to as well, like moving into that sort of realm of your now you have your own items that you put out would you want to sort of like kind of divert or, or like keep that as part of the store like a, a a standalone line but also keep inventory or would you want to move more towards just your own standalone line yeah i don't think that um i would ever fully be just um 100 percent our own line um, yeah i think that most of the things that we have in here right now brand wise are because these are friends and family of mine over the industry from years um these are brands that I've worked with 
over the last 15 years and then some of them I've become really close with you know so it's more about working with like friends and family for me and that even goes plays into like when we're buying and kind of curating our selection at times right now we're still building our overall brand list so this definitely isn't final form but I would say that the reason why we've opened with the things that we have are because they're people that I'm close to, you know? And so even if certain brands right now don't make sense next to each other, the common bond is that like, they're my homies though, yeah. you know? So that's why we, that's why we have it. So I don't think we'll ever be like a hundred percent just our private label because of that, because there's just so many people that I think make great things that I want to work with, yeah. but I also just love so much different stuff. And I don't think that I'll ever like have, not the ability, but I don't think I'll ever just put out the full range of everything that I love. Like when I know somebody is great at making this particular style of clothing or great at these graphics or whatever, like I'm going to want to have that because I want to like represent people for their talent more than anything. You Got know? you. So for yeah. sure. Awesome. Well, I think we got a, a, a decent uh, lot. I mean, your story has been amazing so far. I mean, not so far, but it's in, in, in its entirety. Yeah, uh, do you have anything you want to tell people to like, you know, go check out or? Oh, man. Like, you know, what are you right working now, on? I mean, just uh, we just got our, our Instagram page mania underscore MR MRKT. And uh, we're kind of catching up on content and all that. So right mm -hmm. now, as I explained to you before, everything kind of in store face to face with the customer has been the most important. Yeah. So in the future, um, you know, we'll be kind of, you know, upping our content, getting more consistent with that, as well as, you know, launching uh, things in the future. So I would just say stay tuned. Awesome. Yeah. Well, sweet. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, man. Right on. All right. I do the LA thing, huh? You gotta do the. This <laughs> That's the, the West Coast. This is the East Coast. Huh. I know you just like that. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other day I was like, oh.